this is biotechnica and you're listening to india's first life science podcast the voice of biotechnica never invest in something that you don't understand the technology ask the pool of investors patients and business partners who relied heavily on elizabeth holmes charisma who by the way is the ceo and founder of a so called revolutionary blood testing company called thelmos it was one of those silicon valley stories that just sounded too good to be true much of like a science fiction hello lovely biotechnicians welcome to yet another sensational episode of voice of biotechnica i am urmi mada and i'm going to take you through the rise and fall of theranos and how it managed to pull off what can probably be called as the biggest fraud of the millennium elizabeth holmes was everything silicon valley and the media could hope for a brilliant young female entrepreneur who dropped out of stanford at the age of 19 to start this company called theranos which promised to save people from the pain and disease through early detection and thus lead the way into an era of cheaper and more consumer driven healthcare theranos's big idea was to replace the traditional venous blood draws in a doctor's office hospital or lab with just a simple finger prick the company promised that one day patients would be able to do these tests at home itself and upload the result for their doctors the silicon valley darling at one time valued at 9 billion dollars claimed that it only needed a microscopic amount of blood for its automated blood tests elizabeth has now been unmasked as a fraud and is facing numerous criminal charges the man behind uncovering this truth and breaking the original story about theranos is john carreyrou a veteran investigative journalist at the wall street journal his reporting revealed that this technology did not work as promised and the company was actually misleading and fooling the customers about its methodology and accuracy of the tests carreyrou went on to write a book called bad blood which documents the history of theranos and tackles with holmes's tactics of flattery and intimidation that fooled the investors and even the press allowing its founders to keep up the deception for quite a long time carreyrou's book is also said to be turned into a movie starring hollywood actress jennifer lawrence as elizabeth holmes elizabeth holmes most often seen in black turtlenecks idolizes Steve Jobs and wanted to replicate the success story of Apple. She probably did not even have the notion that she was going to pull long con and defraud investors when she had dropped out from Stanford. But over the years, Holmes ran into setbacks with her vision of this blood testing device that she was trying to pursue, and instead of admitting those setbacks, she kept on lying to her investors. the lies just kept growing bigger and bigger and eventually the lies got so big and nowhere even close to reality that it became a pretty massive fraud one can never imagine the huge fraud theranos was involved in and one of the big reasons that holmes was able to consistently get funding for her fraud project is that she was able to recruit an all star board of directors with basically military and diplomatic backgrounds people like george shultz who was regent secretary of state henry kissinger secretary of state nsa under nixon william perry who was secretary of defense under clinton bill frist the senate majority leader and james mattis who was the secretary of defense under trump these are just to name a few most of these people have pretty much nothing to do with biotech or silicon valley it's not even their area of expertise but having these high powered people helped her make connections that allowed the scam to continue a few years longer than it should have it seems that it's about who you know not what you know at the point but then without a functioning product the scam was come bound to come to light theranos also had davis boyd on board 
the legendary legislator who arguably was the most famous and most feared lawyer in America at the time having an excellent track record. And when he started working as the outside counsel for Theranos back in 2011, he acted as a scarecrow for the employees. They were afraid that if they spoke up either internally or after they left, would ultimately reach the media or to the regulators and then they would be sued. Members of the government like Henry Kissinger had no business being on the board of Theranos. They were clearly paid by the company to aid in perpetrating fraud. They lied to the investors and doctors alike. Holmes messed up the laboratory results of patients, which the doctors rely on for treating patients. False results mean wrong treatments offered, then putting people's lives at risk. It is much worse than fraud. This is a huge lesson to learn and a public example for any such sociopaths who think they can change the world without having any proper expertise or knowledge. When Carol Yu started looking into the company in the early 2015, Theranos had already gone live with their blood tests for a year and a half in a couple of Walgreens stores in Cap Northern California and then another 40 or 45 Walgreens stores in the Phoenix area. This was a major turning point for the company as it attracted quite some investors who were in large part sold on the investment just by the notion that the product has already commercialized. High profile investors who collectively lost hundreds of millions of dollars included Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education and a family, the media mogul Rupert Murdoch, Coxes of the Cox Enterprises in Atlanta and the heirs of Sam Walton who founded Walmart. The company also allegedly claimed that the product was used by the Defense Department on the battlefield in Afghanistan, generating $100 million in revenue for the company in 2014. For a time, her company was worth more than Spotify, Airbnb and Uber. But today, Theranos is on the verge of liquidation and its backers have seen their investments completely wiped out. This was the most outrageous thing about the scandal, as the founder knew very well that those tests were unreliable. They claimed to have a technology that could run the full range of laboratory tests from just a drop or two of blood pricked from the finger and can get you very fast results at the fraction of the cost of regular laboratories even cheaper than Medicare. Whereas the truth was, they just had a malfunctioning prototype that was the last iteration of its device called the Mini Lab, and a previous iteration of the technology called the Edison, so named after Thomas Edison, that was actually a very limited machine. It could only do one class of blood tests known as immunoassays. It was an error-ridden machine which didn't do these tests well. They had about 250 tests on the menu, so for the rest of the tests on the menu, they hacked machines made by German conglomerate Siemens and had those machines modified in order to accommodate small blood samples. Then there was this third test of set of tests that they just run the regular way with Venus draws, drawing the same amount of blood and running it on commercial analysis, just like others did. So how is that in a highly regulated industry in the US? Elizabeth Holmes and her colleagues managed to sway regulators and Walgreens into believing that this should actually be put to use on real patients. One thing that Theranos exploited was a regulatory no man's land in the laboratory space. On one hand, there was this FDA which regulates reviews and approves the laboratory instruments that the labs buy off the shelf and use in their labs. And on the other hand, there was the CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which handles the clinical laboratories. There was also this third category of tests, known as laboratory developed tests, known as LDTs, which are fashioned by labs with their own methods, and those aren't really regulated by either of these entities. 
Elizabeth Holmes and her partner Sunny Balwani were able to exploit this third category. They believed that they were falling under this category of LDTs. And because they were using their own proprietary machines within the walls of their own lab, they did not have the need to be reviewed by the FDA or CMS, which doesn't look closely at LEDs. This was the loophole that they were able to exploit. To justify her questionable actions all along the way, former Therano CEO Elizabeth Holmes really did believe that she was doing something positive for the world and that creating this machine would help that would be able to run every test known to man with just a pinprick of blood would really be good for the society. Needless to say, this was a reason she was able to carry out such a huge fraud with such confidence. John Carreyrou expressed in a recent interview that Holmes seemed to have a condition called noble cause corruption, which is why she ultimately believed that she was going to achieve when she got there, it was going to be a good thing for humanity. And therefore, every lie she cut along the way was justified. Theranos used the Walgreens partnership to raise around $700 million from investors. And despite the fact that the company did not use its own device and had to use hacked commercial machines to run the blood tests. In order to test such small amounts of blood, Theranos had to dilute the blood which definitely raised issues with the accuracy of the tests. Besides endangering the public health, the key thing to remember is that the company was running out of money then. And so by going live with the technology, they were able to solicit new funding. But in the end, the company had to avoid nearly 1 million blood test results. Elizabeth Holmes was indicted on criminal charges related to wire fraud and decided to step down as CEO. She could spend 20 years in prison if convicted by a jury. Holmes attempted to settle with the Securities and Exchange Commission SEC, agreeing to pay a $5 lakh dollar fine. The SEC even barred her from serving as an officer or director of a public company for 10 years. Federal prosecutors also filed criminal charges against the company's CEO, Sunny Balwani. Both of them are facing charges involving defrauding investors as well as doctors and patients. Theranos had been attempting to validate its technology for years with pharmaceutical companies and all these validation studies with big pharma companies had failed. Since they were running out of options in the early 2010, way back, they decided to go straight to consumers and the way to do that was to lie with the retail partner. And so they started quoting Walgreens, telling them about their so-called great technology and how it is portable and can do all these tests just with a drop of blood. They proposed to partner with Walgreens. And Walgreens, being desperate for a new way to reboot growth, started meeting Elizabeth in Palo Alto in Chicago, where Walgreens is based, and it hired a laboratory consultant named Kevin Hunter as part of their due diligence. Kevin Hunter, as is explained in Carrero's book, very early on smelled a rat and tried to alert Walgreens executives before partnering with Theranos, but they turned a deaf ear to his suspicions. According to Carrero, they had the fear of missing out on the Theranos technology and that if they didn't pursue it, then Theranos would in turn turn around and forge a deal with CVS, their arch rival based in Rhode Island. So they completely ignored their own in-house consultant. Thus, these tests were getting done in Walgreens where they were hyping their technology. Walgreens is this dodgy year-old business based in Chicago, which is far from the razzle-dazzle of Silicon Valley. But then there was this factor. Theranos had a major champion within the ranks of Walgreens executives in the person of J. Rosso, named as Dr. J, who was a trained doctor and who was absolutely head over heels for Elizabeth. He had quite a lot to play in convincing Walgreens to commercialize Theranos technology. Media also contributed by publishing cover stories on unfamous magazines and so forth. Even big names like Forbes, 
did contribute a lot to publicize homes in the early days. The lesson is that these college dropouts are in, are in the end just young kids and press have turned them into these icons, these heroes and quite a vo- of course what the young generation may aspire to become when they come out of college and graduate, graduate school. Theranos scandal should make us re-examine this whole value system. There was nothing much to hear from the medical community as well. It is quite surprising that they weren't any, there weren't any flags from players in the industry questioning the technology behind these blood tests. They were only diminished whispers, especially in the field of laboratory science. The bottom line is that the company was so secretive and if at all anything, very little was filtering out of the company itself. So while there were some skeptics in academia and in the field of laboratory testing, they could only say that there was this company getting a lot of hype and whose founder was becoming a Silicon Valley celebrity. At the same time, they also said, the company wasn't doing what usually is done in medicine, which is why they felt the need to publish studies about the innovation in peer-reviewed publications and have it properly checked and reviewed by the peers. There were a couple of laboratory scientists who actually wrote op-eds in scientific journals. One of them was Dr. Ryan Eddies at Stanford, who came out with a JAMA op-ed titled is biomedical innovation happening outside the peer-reviewed literature. There was yet another laboratory scientist at the University of Toronto who had an op-ed in another scientific journal. But then again, there are only few people who actually read them. The Wall Street Journal, which was more popular among people, did start raising alarm bells about the secrecy about the stuff, where they called it the stealth research and suggested that anything which doesn't happen in the industry should be peer-reviewed first. It certainly hasn't been the way medical science has unfolded for the past century and to their credit, they were on the right track. They didn't have the goods in terms of knowing what was actually going on behind the scenes, but they did have the right intuition. The story sounds a lot like what we hear from Silicon Valley. The company is over-promising and under-delivering. Elizabeth Holmes lost sight of the fact that it was first and foremost a healthcare company, a medical company whose product doctors and patients were going to rely on and did rely on for a while for these blood tests. And as Elizabeth said at the height of her fame, that 70% of medical decisions that doctors make are based on blood tests. So when you are in medical space and realm and you deliver a product that doesn't work, then lives are at stake. While it's okay most of the time to behave this way in traditional technology, it absolutely isn't in healthcare technology. Nobody has that right to play with people's lives. Elizabeth Holmes definitely proved to be a very intelligent and smart woman, having big blue eyes, a very charismatic personality with a very heavy manly commanding voice. And one of the reasons why she managed to pull off this massive fraud is the psychophant behavior in our own culture and across the media who could not fathom a CEO being dishonest or a sociopath. Certainly we all have learned quite some lessons now. Fraud, lies and dishonesty doesn't last for long and definitely leads to a huge downfall just like that. As rightly said by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, science is a beautiful gift to humanity. We should not distort it. Keeping that in mind, let us all work together to make, a, make the world a better place and save it from people like Elizabeth Holmes. Thank you all. Do share your comments and opinions with us and don't forget to tune back again on Wednesday to be a part of our next episode.